when you, how did you actually come here at the first? Because were with. you not at the rugby club? Well, I played rugby. That yeah. was my sport. Um, and by chance, it, it, Pat Stack was the manager at the time, and I was approached by Dr. Yellowley, who mm -hmm. was a GP in the town. Um, the, the, there was an issue in terms of physio had been here, had been ill, um, and could I step in? And at that time, it was maybe for about you know a few months. That was how I saw it. So I said, yeah, but I still wanted to play rugby. I mean, I was a fan of the club. I mean, I'd been to come to the game since I was ten years old, so I was delighted to be asked. But I was only you know twenty, twenty one, and what? And I was playing rugby and decent, decent level, and I enjoyed it. So the agreement we came to was that I would do the Tuesday and Thursdays, but I'd play rugby on a Saturday because I thought it was short term. Um, and then it came to the end of the season, and nobody had said anything. I thought, no, I don't want to outstay my welcome here. So I kind of said to, to Pat, look, you know, I've done my bit, thanks, I've really enjoyed it. He said, no, 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 I want you to stay. Um, so then there was a kind of decision for me to make that if that was going to be longer term, I needed to make a commitment. So I retired from rugby at 21, <laughs> which was, a, <laughs> I, I must have, uh, I, I was a sore one for me. But I mean, the first, um, the first few months, it was ridiculous because I was training on a Tuesday and Thursday here mm -hmm. and playing on a Saturday. I mean, I would get, you know, I'd come in with a black eye and bruised and, you know, lumping about on a Tuesday night and somebody would come in for a wee sort of stud mark rate, well, you have a look at that. And I was in a worse state than some of the boys that I was <laughs> training, you know. So, uh, by chance, it came from that. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, Doc Yelley was the club doctor at the time as well, so that kind of fitted in well. So. He was my kind of mentor when I was here as a, a young boy, but mm -hmm. but enjoyed it, enjoyed doing the rehab, and because I was kind of fit and worn right in terms of that, it was good fun doing that as well with some of the boys, because um, one of the boys, it was Dave McGovern, was it? Mm -hmm. he, he'd he had a really bad um, fracture, um, and kind of took him through all that in terms of doing the, the functional stuff apart from the treatment side. So I always kind of joke about, you know, I came for three months and ended up here for, what, 23 years or something like that, so... But that that was how it started. Yeah. But, I mean, Pat was the quietest man in the world, you know. So, uh, so quiet. Whereas George Stewart was the lively one, you know. But right. I always remember falling out with Paul Donnelly in the treatment room. In the old one, obviously. Uh -huh. um, it was a th Thursday night and he came in and he'd been injured with his ankle. And, uh, I mean, I'd been... It's quite as part, I suppose, in terms of that. And, and Paul came and said, oh, my ankle's worse. My ankle's worse. And we still laugh about it to this day, because <laughs> as I'm treating him, and I took that personally, that I wasn't helping him. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking at him on the Thursday night. Um, and then halfway through the treatment, he says, yeah, it was feeling so good, because he was at Harriet Watt Uni. He says, I went out for a, like, a five-mile road run yesterday. And at that point, I just kind of lost the plot. <laughs> and I went... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it was, and then Pat was outside and all I heard was Pat, he actually knocked the door and he came in and he says, Pip, you alright? <laughs> alright, alright, him, do my nothing. <laughs> and Paul's going, oh I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but Paul was one of these fitness fanatics, mm -hmm. you couldn't help himself. Mm -hmm. But that was the trouble of being part time because you had them for a few hours, mm -hmm. but you didn't know what the rest of the time they were doing. Yeah. But he did himself and he, he obviously thought I wasn't going to react the way I did, but he just called me at a bad time. <laughs> but we still laugh about it, we're pals, so it's alright. Is there any injury that you had from any player that you think you wouldn't have had if you hadn't played rugby? Yeah, well, I mean, to be fair, at that time, the first person that I ever saw was Jim Brown. Right. Which, you know oh, the story yeah. of Jim. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've never seen anything like that. Um, and to this day, I've probably never seen anything like that. Right. Even though the technology is better. Um, so, I mean, that was a tough one because he was under the surgeons and stuff, but it was way out with um, what physio was going to help him mm -hmm. with, you know. Um, so that was a real mm -hmm. <laughs> um, good start to yeah. coming here, you know, and seeing Jim. Um, but of all the... I mean, I was lucky that I never had any... I mean, you had injuries that needed surgery and things, but I never had anything that was really career threatening. Mm -hmm. The only thing is with George, I mean, George went through a time 
of horrendous injuries, serious injuries, George Boyle. Yeah. Um, and I mean, his, his knee injury um, was pretty significant and he mm -hmm. did well to come back from that. But then, like a lot of boys that have real long-term ones, something else happened, something else happened. Mm. And kind of George kind of got into that thing where it was one thing after the other and all pretty significant. Um, but, you know, you, you battled through a lot and you worked really hard. But, I mean, I know circumstances, a lot of people don't like George. But for me personally, mm -hmm. I mean, he worked so hard with me. Um, mm -hmm. And I can't fault him for that, you know. Mm -hmm. But George had a tough time because it was significant ones all the time that were happening mm -hmm. to him. Mm -hmm. But Jim Brown would be the one that you would say that was out with my scope. Uh -huh. <laughs> You're telling a new story about George that he actually stayed with you at one point. Oh, aye. Well, <clears throat> at that time, uh, I'd moved out to Comley, mm -hmm. bought one of my old Ennis houses, mm -hmm. and George had as well. And uh, it was at the time after his knee injury that he ruptured his Achilles tendon. And uh, we got him operated on. I phoned from the team bus on the Saturday of St Martin coming home to get Malcolm Medical, the surgeon, and he very kindly operated on George on the Sunday. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the relationship that we had. Mm -hmm. So that was brilliant. Um, but then he was in plaster and crutches. In those days it was plaster and crutches, not a moon boot, you know. So he, his wife, went back to Ireland and mm -hmm. left them in the house. I mean, George was the most domesticated at the best of times, but with a <laughs> pair of auxiliary crutches and a stookie, he was, he, he was even worse. So he ended up staying in our house. Mm -hmm. So we looked after him for the full six, eight weeks that he was disabled. Um, we put a bed, we had a sort of wee room about this size mm -hmm. that we had a wee study downstairs, so we made it in a bedroom. Um, and he got looked after, and by chance, one of Nora's friends um, was staying with us and she was moving in between houses and was by chance staying with us for two or three months. So Alison ended up being there during the day looking after him till we got back. I mean, George had a life of luxury for it. <laughs> we had, you know, Nora running after him, Alison running after him, me saying, you're all right. I mean, everything was in place for him. Mm -hmm. um, so he ended up staying that, that length of time till it, and eventually, once he got the class, I said, look, you need to go home. <laughs> you know, you can't stay here all the time again. So that's out with the, the physio unit. <laughs> I once did it for Jackie McNamara as well. I ended up looking mm -hmm. after his dog for a, a, over a Christmas. He got a bad dead leg. We had a game in the Boxing Day. And I was bringing him up. We were up here Christmas Day two, three times in the day trying to get the leg a wee bit better. But he couldn't, he had wee spaniel Otis. I'll never forget it. So he couldn't walk it. So I ended up taking it for four days and had it in the garden. The next time I went in the garden, it was the best JCB I've ever seen. All I saw was these holes in my nice garden getting ripped up. Well, I'm looking after him and Jackie was up at, you know, up at two away. He was staying up there, no? So, yeah, we've, we've done our wee bits and pieces like that out with yeah. the kind of normal remit of a physio, I would say. Yeah. But, uh, but you do what you do. Yeah. And when you were saying that about, you know, injuries <coughs> then compared to injuries now and the advancement and, and how you can um, improve an injury, yeah. you know, I mean, the, the technical side of it must be... I think a combination, I think the the the, um, the quality, not, well that quality is not the right word, but the techniques of surgery are, are so much better. So for example, like when boys had cruciate injuries, when I first started, surgeons would stick them in a knee brace for six to eight weeks, not allow them to straighten them. Now, I mean, it's a small incision they're immediately walking the next day and they're encouraging you to get them full range of movement. So the protocols have changed for the better because they understand and the techniques are better. It's more about getting things moving. So, um, you know, things that we would think are really major uh, destabling injuries, the techniques are there if, if, you know, the people to go to. And, not, and the other side of that comes into, you know, on our own trumpet, the medical staff and that. But the other thing that's that's good now is that you've got sports science, you've got strength and conditioning, and you've got medical. And to me, in my time, I ended up doing a bit of all, all mm -hmm. of that, because you know what it's like at clubs, you're with one person. <coughs> Whereas now, you've got these three, but I think the important thing is that they, they all discuss with each other and amalgamate, because there's bits that overlap. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be that the physio is fighting to like strength and condition doing the last bit and things. And I think when you're at a full-time club and you've got all the facilities there, that's what can make the life of a player so much easier because he's getting all that input to try and get back. Mm -hmm. And you need them to, to buy into it. But um, I think the, the, that covers better. 
and obviously the, the, the recovery from surgeries is a lot better, which helps the boys to get on. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's good. Mm -hmm. um, when I was checking you out... Oh no, <laughs> my memory's not too good now, so you need to point um, in the right direction. You were here, and the length of time you were here, were relegated four times. Right. We were promoted five times and you were working under eight different managers. Yeah. Um, so you don't don't ask me who's the best now because I, I wouldn't <laughs> want to upset somebody that's in here. Was there any, did, the, did the managers then leave you to it? Yeah, yeah, mostly. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the, the, in the first scenario with, with, with Pat, I mean, it was, I mean, I was new to it all sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and it was part time, um, but I mean I think I had a good rapport with, you know, like Leash, Ian Munro. Um, I mean, again, Tom Forsyth came when I mean Tom came from a huge environment at Rangers, mm -hmm. full time to a part time scenario, um, and I think it'd be fair to say that was probably a bit frustrating for him. Um, but in the full time scenarios with, you know, like Leash, um, Ian. I had a good relationship with Dick, um, even and Jockey Scott. I, I, I have to say, I mean, Jockey again is one that I know that there's little issues in terms of historically mm -hmm. with, with folk. But Jockey, from the environment he came from Aberdeen, I learned so much from him because his organisation behind the scenes, you know, getting breakfast for kids never been done here before, organising lunches, having afternoon sessions, um, and just all that side in terms of how he planned things and that, um, for me he was really really good mm -hmm. from, from my own development if you like um, and he gave you the leeway to do what you and you discuss things and whatever so um, I've been lucky that way with, with, with all the managers that I've had and Jimmy Calderwood as well, um, mm -hmm. I had you know with him and Jimmy Nick and um, we all kind of worked really well together. Mm -hmm. So no, it's been I've been fortunate that way that I've never had folk that have um, not listened to what you said. Yeah. Did JC Jimmy Collarwood bring something different to the club when he came? Because obviously he had been, uh, although he was Scottish, he, he yeah. had been working in Holland a long time. So did he bring something different to the club then? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, it usually involved a pint and glass, <laughs> I mean, have to say. but uh, no, I mean, I, th I think he brought the culture of, um, I th when he first came, he was amazed how quickly everybody disappeared after a game, and that was a big issue for him, he didn't like that, um, and you know, we'd, we'd all in our own way, before all the, the stuff that you hear now about recoveries and do this and carbohydrates and all that, I mean, we'd done bits and pieces and all that with, with jockey and stuff mm -hmm. that long ago. But I mean, Jimmy was up on that in terms of, you know, recovery, getting the boys to, to eat after a meal. And that was his whole thing about getting the boys. And one, it was the camaraderie of being together, win, lose or draw. But it was an opportunity to make sure that they had, had a chance to replenish before they went out and did what they, they did sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So little things like that, his training, a lot of technical stuff in it. Um, Jimmy Nick was a great foil for him. You know, mm -hmm. if Jimmy was having a grumpy day, Jimmy Nick would be the one that would put the arm around the shoulder and, mm -hmm. and whatever. Uh, and they worked really well together. And and, and I, I had a great time with the two of them. It was uh, it was good. Mm -hmm. And it's funny now, you know, when you have folk like, like Jimmy or like the boys downstairs, when I've had them as players, as, as physio, you know. I mean, remember Jimmy Nick had a, a bad pelvic thing. Mm -hmm. And obviously he was at the end of his career. And I took him to see a specialist in Edinburgh, and it was a pelvic thing, so he was going to have to be out for six months. So we come out of the spire in Edinburgh, and Jimmy handed me the he he'd taken his car, and he just chucked the keys of the car. You're driving. I goes right. Where are we going then? He says, We're going into town. We're going into Bar Roma. I'm having a bottle of red wine. You're driving <laughs> <laughs> after he caught the news. So so we ended up. That, that was another bit where you ended up the taxi driver now, apart from looking after dogs and, you know, <laughs> giving folk breakfast and things. And then when we started doing his rehab, we were, big thing in those days was the aqua jogger in the pool. So I said, right, Jimmy, we're going to go in the pool, do this, you can't run, but you can do that in the pool. Yeah, 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 yeah all right. So it goes in, 
and we're in Carnegie and there's the old dear six year olds, you know, dotting about and thought and asking how he's doing and that. He jumps in and I says, Right, you need to get where you can't get your feet. He says, I can't swim. I says, Well you know tell me that before you go in the pool. I'm standing outside with my flip flops and the tracksuit on and that, you know. I says, Well look, just go beside the wall and just try doing the running and you know that you're there just to get the confidence well it was hilarious I mean he wouldn't go more than three yards away from the wall and he would come in three yards come in and all these folk going up and down doing backstroke butterfly and everything going is he all right <laughs> once he got the hang of it and he realized there was a bit of boy and say he was all right but, and then the first real session we managed to do after getting him a confidence in it he came out the pool and he put it on his big and he chucked it right in the middle of the pool and lay on the, the floor exhausted. And I thought, well, you'll need to go and get it. I can't go. And I had to get one of the, the folk in the pool to bring it out because he'd just gone off. <laughs> but, so it's, it's kind of funny when you've had all these folk, I mean, I'm digressing a little bit, but in terms of, like, as coaches, when you've, you've seen mm -hmm. them as players and had them mm -hmm. as players. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's been good fun. Yeah, it, it must have been because... Uh, I suppose when you, when you see the back, you know, what goes on in the background of the World Cup, I mean, uh, yes, they work hard, but yeah, it can be a lot of fun as well. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, I mean, obviously the club here at times had financial struggles and that, and that, that's tough to, I mean, I don't care what anybody says that, I mean, still you've got mortgages to pay boys and that, and that, that, that they always say, you know, we just get on with what we need to do, but it's always there in the background, mm -hmm. I think. So, I mean, they're, they're kind of tough times when clubs go through that. Um, but once you get the group together, and that's what you enjoy in terms of, um, you know, you, you win and lose, and you hope you're winning more than you lose, because it, it is good times. And, and I'm sure all the players will say the best times they've had is when they've been playing. And I'm sure mm -hmm. all the boys that have been here would say that. And that's all part of it. It's that banter and the camaraderie and being together. Mm -hmm. And generally getting on okay. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's, well, obviously we, at the moment we've got Stevie Crawford as manager and Jason and Greg Shields, so you obviously had them as players yeah. as well. All very good boys, very well behaved. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of them had a real serious injury. No, they? that's why I like them, because yeah. they were all right. In fact, I always remember Charlton. When, when Greg went to Charlton from here, and I'm really sorry because he's such a, he was a model pro. Um, and uh, the boy phoned me up and said, uh, have you got any notes? And I says, can I tell you, there's nothing, Greg has had nothing. He's never been in the treatment room once in all the time he's been here. And I think the guy thought I was towing him a line just because he was, you know, moving. I says, seriously, I says, the, the, the boy's, he's not even had a cut finger. Yeah. So... So you like boys like that, mm -hmm. um, but you get to know the players. I mean, you know, I mean, like Nori was like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, Nori was. If Nori stayed down, you knew that there was something. I mean, mm -hmm. I saw somebody had um, a photo of me a lot younger on Facebook for today, and they had the photo of Nori with the the the, the shin guard that was burst. But I mean, Nori was like. I mean, you know, there have been other boys that had been out for ages with that, but Nori just uttered himself and go on with it. Mm -hmm. Whereas like Stuart Petrie used to go down and Stuart would take all of two minutes to get up even if he just had a wee bump and you thought, you know you're going to go on here and by the time you get on there, he'll have stood up and the ref will be waving you off and making you look an idiot. And I always used to say to Stuart, can you try and get up a wee bit quicker from just falling down? Because it was always the ref was like this and go, here we go. And then he'd pick himself up. Mm. You alright? Ah, fine. Right, okay. So, but you just get to know him, don't you? Oh, yeah. Did you ever come a cropper against a referee for doing, for going on the pitch when you were not allowed no. as opposed to? <laughs> no, I had one at race and it was the the guy Crombie, was oh, it? Mm. This is going back along. My mate mm -hmm. was doing no two, but it's holding up here. And it was a horrendous tackle. I think it was on George. It was at Starts Park. I'm not sure, I'm, I, I can't, maybe I'm wrong with that, but I remember it being a horrendous tackle. And I ran on the pitch and I was, you just get protective of the boys, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was so unlike me and I just said to him, you're going to get somebody's leg broken here. And I don't know why I said it and what made me say it, but I just, I was just so <laughs> And I could just feel the rest sort of standing there right over the side of me. And the next thing he stood up, he says, 
don't ever do that again, don't ever say that again. And I thought, I'm going off, what have I done? I'm going to get done here. But he fortunately let me off with it. I mean, maybe in this day and age you wouldn't get away with that, but he just gave me a sort of like a teacher telling and mm -hmm. get off and shut up. And if you come on, don't say another thing. I hate, okay, ref, sorry. Because suddenly you have this wee moment, you think, oh, what have I done? What have I done? So, but the only other time that I had a real nightmare was when Lee stood my glasses in the old dugout. It was an oh. evening game. I've needed distance since I was 18, right? Mm. And uh, it was in the old ones, the wooden hut thing. And managers are horrendous. Tommy, uh, Tom Forsyth did it once in my Airdrie, where I was sitting on the end of a bench and he went like that and he shoved me and I ended up in the dirt track because it wasn't a dugout, you were yeah. just on a bench. Mm -hmm. Anyway, same thing with Leash. I'm sitting there watching the game and he's giving it one of them. He's a wee bit bigger than me, to mm -hmm. be fair. So he's stunted me. My glasses have come off and then he's done that and he stood on them. And I went, so I picked them up and they were like mangled. I couldn't, and then it was one of those that, because it was distance, I couldn't tell. I mean, if, if the ref put his hand up for a free kick, I didn't know if he was waving me on or if it was a free <laughs> kick or whatever. And I was blind for about 30 minutes. Didn't have a clue what was, and I was. I thought, right, I'm not moving until somebody nudging me, say, you want you, sort of thing, because I'd made up my mm -hmm. mind that I wasn't going to get embarrassed by running on and then ref mm -hmm. going, what are you doing here, sort of thing. So that was one where it could have potentially gone a bit pear shaped. But the one with Mr. Crombie, that was the one where I got into a wee bit of verbal bother, but no more than that, fortunately. <laughs>